A woman named Ruth Emily Kay lived a long and seemingly rewarding life. For years, she had worked as a nurse in Australia and was praised for her selfless care of patients. On February the 5th, 1944, Ruth celebrated her 100th birthday, receiving a telegram from the Governor General, flowers from the council, and a bottle of champagne from her friends. Two months later, she passed away peacefully at Loretto Convalescent Home in Strathfield. It wasn't until many years after her death that Ruth's real name and shocking past in England were revealed. The prosperous Kent family lived in a spacious three-storied mansion, Road Hill House, here in the tiny village of Road in Somerset. The head of the household, 59-year-old Samuel Savile Kent, was a deputy inspector of clothing factories and was quite the upright and indeed pious man. Samuel and his first wife, Marianne Windus, married in 1829 and over the next 15 years, Mary would give birth to 10 children. Sadly, most of them would pass away at an early age, with only four surviving to witness the gruesome events of the summer of 1860, William, Mary, Elizabeth and Constance. Despite or perhaps because of these many births, Marianne became a sickly woman, suffering readily from physical illness and anxiety. Because of this, Samuel eventually hired a governess named Mary Drew Pratt to take care of the house and children. On May the 5th, 1852, Mary Ann suddenly passed away from a bowel obtrusion, and it wasn't long afterwards that rumours of an affair between Samuel and the governess began. These tales seemed to be confirmed when, the following year, the two were married. By June of 1860, Mary Drew had three children of her own and was pregnant with her fourth. Roadhill House had become quite full by this point, with Mary, Samuel and their seven children being joined by three live-in maidservants. But despite the large number of persons in the household, the Kents were living very peacefully, seemingly having no issues whatsoever. Every evening, the family gathered for prayers before bedtime. Samuel and Mary slept in a second floor bedroom with their daughter, Mary Amelia, in a cot. The nearby nursery was occupied by a nurse, Elizabeth Goff, one-year-old Eveline and three-year-old Frances. 16-year-old Constance and 15-year-old William slept in separate bedrooms, while the two eldest daughters, Mary Ann and Elizabeth, shared a room. The rest of the help, cook Sarah Kerslake and housemaid Sarah Cox, roomed together on the third floor. The evening of June the 29th was much like any other for the residents of Roadhill House. While the Kents got ready for bed, the daytime staff left, locking the gate to the high fence surrounding the mansion as they went. Elizabeth put the youngest members of the family to bed in the nursery around 8 p.m. and by 11.30 p.m. Samuel had checked all the doors and windows of the house before retiring to the master bedroom. The large home then fell quiet, the peace only disturbed by barking from the neighbor's dogs around 1 a.m. Barking dogs are not an unusual event in the countryside, and so anyone in the house who may have stirred due to this noise would have quickly drifted back off to sleep. At 5 a.m. on June 30, 1860, Elizabeth Goff awoke. It was still early, but she decided to leave her bed and check on the children. She found little Eveline fast asleep in her crib, but when she turned to Frances's cot, the boy was nowhere to be seen. The young nursemaid wasn't immediately concerned, however, as Mary occasionally took Frances to the master bedroom at night. So Elizabeth returned to her bed and slept for another hour. At 7 a.m., as the house began to stir, Elizabeth knocked on Mr. and Mrs. Kent's bedroom door to ask if she should take the boy. Mary looked confused as she told the nursemaid that Frances wasn't with her and hadn't been so the entire night. 
A frantic search of the mansion quickly ensued, but the three-year-old was nowhere to be found. According to Elizabeth, when she saw the boy's empty crib that morning, it still had the impression of where he had been lying. It was as if he had been softly taken out. Perhaps in denial about the situation, she remained adamant that Mary had taken the boy during the night. Though Francis hadn't been found, the search of the mansion revealed that a door had been left unlocked and a window left open in the drawing room. Suspecting his son had been kidnapped, Samuel sent one of his employees to alert the village policeman, his son William to fetch the local parish constable and his daughter Constance to hurry to the local priest. The family offered a reward of £10 to anyone who found the child, roughly £1,000 in today's money. Whilst this was going on, Samuel left for the police station in the nearby town of Trowbridge to report Francis missing there. During his absence, the news of the boy's disappearance spread and people of the village arrived at Roadhill House to assist in the search. Among them were two men, a William Nutt, a shoemaker, and Thomas Benger, a farmer. As they entered the grounds, Nutt stated, I shall look for a dead child as well as a living one. With that said, they decided to check the staff privy, which lay amongst the shrubs in the mansion's grounds. When they opened the door, they were met with a most horrific scene. At their feet was a pool of blood. The privy, or toilet, consisted of a wooden seat above a pit. Between the seat and the pit, was a splashboard laying roughly two feet deep. It was on this board that the two villagers discovered the bloodied body of Francis Savile Kent. His poor small body bore several vicious wounds and he had been near decapitated. The body was examined by a family doctor who estimated the three-year-old had died about 3 a.m. that morning. When Superintendent John Foley arrived at the family home around 10 a.m., he thoroughly examined the house. While Samuel Kent was convinced his son's killer was a stranger, the police weren't so sure, nor were the villagers of Road. In the following Monday's Evening Standard, a reporter wrote, From the manner in which the child was taken away and murdered, the deed was done by some inmate of the house. Naturally, the first person to fall under suspicion was Elizabeth Goff. She slept in the same room and she failed to notify immediately her employers of Francis's absence. Superintendent Foley, perhaps inspired by local rumours, painted a story of what he believed had happened. He claimed that Goff had sneaked a lover into her room that night, but they had been seen by Francis. The young boy was known to tell his mother everything, and so to silence him, two lovers smothered the boy and then mutilated his body to hide the true cause of death. Having already married a former employee, some even theorised that Samuel Kent had been the nursemaid's lover. Others claimed it was William Nutt, one of the men who had discovered the body. Elizabeth was eventually arrested on July the 10th, after which wild rumours about her confessing to the brutal murder began circulating in the village. But in the end, the rumours were only rumours, and because the police had little evidence for their claims, Elizabeth was soon released. The murder had drawn widespread interest and Foley's failure led to the Wiltshire police receiving much criticism. With the investigation going nowhere, magistrates wrote to the Home Secretary to ask for a detective to be sent to investigate the crime. The Metropolitan Police stepped in and on July the 15th, they sent the famous inspector, Jonathan Jack Witcher, dubbed Prince of Detectives by his colleagues to look at the case. Detective Witcher quickly concluded that the open window downstairs in the drawing room was nothing but a red herring, meaning Whoever the murderer was, they were part of the family or staff. The detective interviewed the Kent family's current and former employees had learned something interesting. Two of the older children, William and Constance, 
did not receive the same favour from their parents or other villagers as the rest of the Kent children. After speaking with both teenagers and others who knew the siblings, Detective Witcher became more and more convinced that Constance had something to do with her stepbrother's murder. The 16-year-old was described as having a strong, obstinate and determined will and an irritable and impassioned nature, in addition to a powerful physique. It was no secret that she wasn't exactly happy about living under her stepmother's rule. When she was 13, she and her brother William ran away. Constance dressed as a boy and the pair hoped to be taken on board a ship as cabin boys. However, they were captured in Bath and returned to road. Witcher also suspected Constance may have had some dangerous instability in her because of her mother, who was believed to have suffered from mental health issues. He believed she was wildly jealous of Francis. She had also previously hidden things in the outside privy. Lastly, the family laundress noticed shortly after Frances's death that one of Constance's nightgowns was missing, the same one she wore the night of the murder. While he lacked physical evidence to link the 16-year-old Constance to her brother's murder, Detective Witcher felt confident enough to arrest her on Friday, July the 20th. Constance asserted her innocence and the Kent's staff stated they had never noticed any bad blood between her and her step-sibling. In fact, quite the opposite. Witcher's case hung on the missing nightgown, but a fresh search of Road Hill House turned up nothing and Constance was released on bail, embracing her father who had come to collect her. The case against her was eventually dropped. Perhaps the nightdress had simply been lost after it had been sent to be laundered as Constant claimed. Though, perhaps not. You see, during the initial investigation carried out by John Foley, a heavily blood-stained nightdress was found stuffed inside a chimney in the Kent mansion. Believing that the perpetrator would return to try and dispose of the item, Foley ordered it to be placed back inside the chimney. Two officers were then told to stay on site so as to capture the murderer red-handed. A great plan. However, it was foiled when the two officers somehow found themselves locked in the kitchen and by the time they were able to return to the chimney, the crucial piece of evidence had disappeared. With his investigation of the crime already receiving heavy criticism, Foley decided to suppress this information. Eventually, the investigation into the murder of Francis Kent hit a brick wall, but the public's interest was endless. To escape the attention, Samuel Kent moved his family to Wrexham in 1861 and sent Constance to a finishing school in Dinan, France. Two years later, in August 1863, Constance returned to the UK and was taken on as a probationer nurse at St. Mary's Home for Female Penitents in Brighton. The home cared for and educated the poor, unmarried mothers and ex-sex workers. Constance is said to have cared for them all, with her service being described as uniformly good by Reverend Arthur Wagner. It would be during her regular confessionals with Wagner that Constance would make the stunning confession that she had murdered her young stepbrother several years prior. And so, on April the 25th, 1865, perhaps seeking penance, 21-year-old Constance Kent walked into London's Bow Street Magistrate Court with a written note that read, quote, I, Constance Emily Kent, alone and unaided, on the night of June 29, 1860, murdered at Road Hill House, Wiltshire, one Francis Savile Kent. Before the deed, none knew of my intention, nor after of my guilt. No one assisted me in the crime, nor in my evasion of discovery." End quote. Detective Witcher, who had been ridiculed for his failure to solve the case and had worked hard to repair his reputation after returning to London, had been right 
all along. However, Constance said the murder was committed not out of jealousy. The public response to this confession was to dismiss it almost entirely. Instead of scorn, Constance received support as many believed her confession to be a lie. They had already convinced themselves that the more salacious tale of Samuel Kent's affair with the nursemaid was the real truth and that Constance was simply taking the fall for her father. Reverend Wagner also found himself coming under fire, figuratively and literally, both by those who thought he had forced the confession out of Constance and those who opposed his refusal to disclose to the court what she had said to him in confessional. Many protests outside St. Mary's ensued, with Wagner being assaulted by two drunks and allegedly shot at. Constance Kent's trial took place on July the 21st, 1865, and lasted less than 30 minutes. She pleaded guilty, refused to answer any questions, and was quickly sentenced to death by hanging. However, Queen Victoria commuted the sentence, perhaps due to Constance's young age, at the time of the murder. In all, Constance Kent would spend 20 years in prison. After her release, she changed her name to Ruth Emily Kay and relocated to Australia, where she worked as a nurse and matron, dying in 1944 at the age of 100. While Constance Kent never recanted her confession, many still believe she wasn't the true murderer. Some think she was protecting her brother, William. Others speculate Samuel Kent himself had something to do with his son's death. So, while the case of the murder at Road Hill House is officially solved, rumours about what happened that night persist more than 160 years later. Thank you for watching. And thank you to our members. And I really do mean that. Thank you to our members because without you, we don't get the chance to come out on location. Right then. Take care and I'll see you next time with another story to make you say, well, I never.